This is Learning Happy Hour with your hosts Mitch Densley and Jason Yates. It's time to learn, laugh, and chat cybersecurity. BYOB, bring your own brain. Cheers! Welcome, everybody. Now, we call Welcome. this Learning Happy Hour because we are here to share, Mitch and I, and we're here to learn, learn from each other, learn from you, and hopefully you guys will get something out of it as well. So we're out of the classroom, out of the stuffy conference room, so we're here. This is Learning Happy Hour, right? So any good happy hour has uh, snacks and good food that goes with it, right? Yes. So, so I did some good ones today, different, different. So I have some uh, tortilla chips, but this isn't the special thing. I made some homemade salsa with green chilies from New Mexico. So, I mean, what else goes with a light beer than, uh, you know, chips and salsa and uh, roasted green chilies? They were doing this outside the back of a, a truck in the grocery store that I like to frequent, and I couldn't pass it out. And I thought, hey, it'd be great learning happy hour. You need just hot wings and a, a sports yeah. game of choice. Right. And, uh, yeah. Well, cool. So, so why are we here today? Yeah. So we want to say cheers, cups up to user ID. Today we're going to be talking about user ID and we've got some uh, great things in store for you guys today. So as always, um, this is really tied to some of the content you may have seen in the 210 course, right? So many of you have tendered. In fact, let, let's see a show of hands. How many of you guys have seen um, 210 or attended 210? Uh, how many of you done that? We just raise your hand. You can see few of you attended 210, so f hopefully f several of you are familiar with user ID. So one of the things that we want to uh, talk about today is Mitch uh, has brewed up something special once again, something uh, I've always wanted to do. haven't quite done it yet, so you walk through the steps. This is really cool. You're going to want to stay tuned to, uh, for that. And then the other thing we're going to do today is we've got a guest speaker with us. Uh, he's a colleague of ours, a fellow trainer. But in his previous life, he's implemented user ID. <clears throat> well, we're going to find out what that is coming up. So we've got this great guest. He's going to come in and, and, and talk to us about that. So, um, but first things first, right, Mitch? We want folks to bring their brain, and uh, it's Kahoot time. Awesome. So the Kahoot is a way for us to kind of check your, your learning, see what you remember from the 210 class, and hopefully you remember taking the Kahoots uh, in the 210 class. And so what we're going to do here is put up a game pen. Jason's loading that for us now. So all of you who are on the session, open up the webpage kahoot.it, and then once the game pen flashes, there we go, one, two, I'm sorry, what's six two one six six? Go ahead and type that in and join us in a knowledge deck. I updated this I kind of like it. Yeah, I got new music. You people crack me up. You might want to turn the volume. <laughs> there you go. True or false? User ID improves visibility into application usage based on user. Fantastic. Now, is that music coming through pretty strong? No, oh, it's it's a little too strong. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing for just a half a second and kill the sound. Okay. And then we'll come I like back to it. Sound, though. Nothing oh, wrong with you? that sound. Yeah, it's just loud. Oh, we'll figure that out later. All right. Can you, are you guys seeing the quiz again? All right. Yeah, yeah. Here we go. Next question. Most everybody's got the right answer. Thanos was right. <laughs> What are the two main functions of user ID? Do we have to pick all of them or just one? Well, there, this one has more than one answer, right? Because it says two main functions. So you only have to pick one. Can't pick more than one. So it's, there you go. 
mapping groups to users and mapping IPs to users, right? So a lot of people think when they think of user ID, uh, and this might be something that uh, you thought, uh, and oftentimes when I'm teaching the class, I mention this question even before we talk about it, and inevitably people mention authentication. User ID is related to authentication, but it's not authentication. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Okay, here we go. What is the true statement about user ID? There's so many good statements. So many good statements. Oh, people are still thinking. You got three seconds, hurry. Oh, oh there's a delay between the Kahoot on your screen and uh, when I get to answer. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah. Interesting. Well, maybe it's because I'm sharing the screen and then you've got the, yep. the answer. All right, cool. Well done, everybody. And then final the question. question. Oh, no, we got two more questions. Second last. True or false, you can use a script to send user IP mappings to the firewall. Can you do that? I, I don't know. Foreshadowing, maybe? <laughs> Foreshadowing. And which version of PanOS introduced using Panorama for user ID redistribution? Hmm. 7718, 8.1. I don't see 6 up there. Did 6 support user ID? You know, I did have that as a possible answer. Oh, before? Before. Yeah. So 6 did support user ID, but it did not support user ID redistribution. Right. And user ID redistribution is um, an important feature. And you can see it was introduced in 8, and of course, it's still supporting 8.1. Um, and we're going to talk more about that, right? Mitch, this is part of what uh, Mitch is going to show us and talk to us about. All right, foreshadowing, now, once again. Foreshadowing. So, Star-Lord, Lord of the podium here, Lord of Cahoots. I wonder who Star-Lord is. We'll never know. All right. All right, so the next thing we want to do is let me just talk a little bit about uh, what we were looking at there in regards to user ID. So uh, I just want to review just a couple of those key concepts and um, be sure we're all on the same page. What we like to call sometimes a level set. And, um, and then um, and I love the chats. These are great chats. And, uh, and then what we're going to do is, is, is Mitch is going to kind of launch this and elaborate a little bit here. So, uh, so as we mentioned today, we're spotlighting, of course, user ID. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what that means. So the two main functions, right? We had one of these questions about what the purpose of user ID is. And as I said earlier, it's not about authentication per se, but it's really about identifying the user behind those IP addresses. So those IPs, right? So a packet comes in and into the firewall. And so the firewall wants to, wants to do what? Wants to apply rules to that traffic. And so to do that, we can do that with user information if user ID is able to map that IP to a username. So one of the key functions is mapping IP to usernames. But we can also build policy rules around groups so that's another benefit of user ID. So the second function is group mapping. So these are the two functions. And of course, the, the end result, the outcome is that we can create rules around users and groups. And we can also uh, look at reporting, right? So we can look at uh, the traffic on our firewall from a user point of view. That's what that first Kahoot question was about, is about looking at app usage from a user standpoint. Now, how does user ID work? You might remember this from the 210 course or from Ignite, or maybe you've implemented user ID. In fact, let me ask you guys a question um, out there. How many of you guys have implemented user ID in your organization? Go chat in and uh, let Mitch and I know how many of you have actually done that. You can raise your hand. Of course, when we say raise your hand, some somebody out there right now is raising their hand, Mitch. They're, they're, With their camera off. Yeah, <laughs> we can't see it. <clears throat> nice. I once did that in class, actually. So, so <laughs> yeah, I, I was teaching an office class, and I had uh -huh. a toolbar up, and um, and I mentioned that uh, if they reach up to the screen, they could actually feel the edge of the toolbar. And I turned around, and about half the class was touching the screen. 
was, I was not expecting that. That was pretty funny. <clears throat> All right. That's so awesome. We get, we get a few of you guys who've actually you know, implemented this and a few, few of you who have not. So um, we're going to talk a little bit more about this and, and, and how to actually implement it. And of course, this is also a big topic on the PCNSE exam if you're pursuing that. So here are the components. It's the, we've got agents, right? You've got the user ID service running in the firewall, and then the firewall has what's called a user ID API, which pulls those mappings in. And then you can deploy an agent onto a Windows server, which is, again, one of the Kahoot questions mentioned that you've got two basic agents. Now, yet we have this other agent called terminal service agent, and it has some unique um, um, uh, aspects to it, but, but primarily we have these two agents that we can deploy to scrape security information so that when a user authenticates, they leave an, uh, uh, an artifact on the network basically saying, hey, I logged into the network, and then if we can feed that information into the firewall, we can discover what uh, the users are behind the IP addresses that they're authenticating from. And so we're able to kind of pull that information in. So when the user sends traffic through the firewall, we have that information. Now, this is an important slide. You may have seen this before. Um, this has to do with the way we can pull that information in. So the agents are pulling that information in, whether it's a Windows agent, uh, whether it's the agent built into the firewall, we're pulling that information in. The question is, um, um, what methods are going to be ideal for you? And there is a difference between some of these methods. So um, before we dive into this, Mitch, uh, I'm just kind of curious, looking at this slide, for those of you who have filled, or who have implemented user ID, which of these have you actually implemented? So for those of you who said yes, are you doing syslog polling or pulling in syslog uh, information after authentication? Are you using global protect? Are you using active directory? Which one of those methods are you using? So we've got global protect, from, uh, Patrick is mentioning that. Yeah, and while people are typing, Jason, if I may, so I love this slide. I call this the rainbow of resolution because it's all of the different methods that, that are supported and it also illustrates the ones we recommend. The ones on the left are the fastest, most reliable, and then it kind of drops off as you go further down to the right. Um, and and Global Protect was the first one I ever implemented. And it's awesome because it's super duper accurate, but it doesn't work for everything. There are some systems that maybe you want to know the, the system that generated the traffic, but that doesn't actively have a user logged into it. I got a story about this a little bit later. Oh, some of these folks uh, have, have even done the TS agent. I see yeah, that. That's great. Right. That's great. That's great. Now, one of the other components of this, remember in the Kahoot question, we had a question about redistribution, which PanOS introduced that. So in PanOS 8, we're also able to actually create basically a user ID infrastructure that allows us to redu uh, redistribute, and I'm having a hard time with that word, apparently. <laughs> um, <laughs> learned IPs with the other firewalls so that timestamps are accurate and basically we're able to keep our network in sync. Have another light beer. Yes, user ID. <laughs> in fact, anytime you know, I say user ID, you take a sip, right? You know, if I may on this, Jason, just for a second. Um, so when user ID was first introduced, uh, we talked a lot about the best way of, of grabbing user mappings and often we'd say, go to Active Directory. The difficulty there is if you've got, let's say 700 firewalls in your infrastructure, all of them then have to pull the singular agent talking to Active Directory and it creates you know, timing problems and then you've just got all this excess traffic going to the central point of potential failure right. that people didn't love. And so in PanOS 7.1, we introduced this feature called user ID redistribution from firewall to firewall. And as you said earlier, we added a support for Panorama as well. And now you can build almost like a mesh of, of mappings and polling and all this other stuff so that if you lose one component, all of your user ID infrastructure doesn't just crap out on you. You've got some redundancy and reliability baked in. So I, I'm really excited about this, if you couldn't tell. Okay, here it is. It is. Demo so magical. So magical. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mitch, uh, why don't you show us a little bit of what you're talking about? All right, all right, fair enough. I, and I was not trying to steal the show from you there because that was. No, that no, was that's great. That was perfect. All right. Let me just figure out how to exit full screen so that I can uh, share. Oh, there it is right there. All right. And can you guys see my screen? Yes, it looks good. Awesome. All right. Now, I don't have the chat up, so I'll let you. There we go. Okay. 
I look displeased. <laughs> okay. Um, so what I want to talk to you guys about first is something that you know, some of the folks online have, have expressed an interest in uh, learning about how to use the XML API uh, to, to feed mappings into the firewall. And what I got here is just a little recording earlier that I took, uh, which shows you how to install. So what I did is I installed this, uh, this program here, this Python application called Pan-Python. So I'm just going to show you download it from GitHub and then create an API role, or you don't have to be called API, that's what I called it, uh, but just a role that only has access to the XML API, because heaven forbid, somehow that credential should get harvested or whatever, you don't want someone to be able to log into your firewall management interface and do nasty stuff. So create a special role, create a special user account, and then go through uh, and install Pan Python on any Linux system. So here, I'm a GUI person, so you can see I'm not doing this all with a CLI. Um, but once you've got the folder extracted, come in to the CLI. So you got my two windows here. One is on the firewall, the other one's on the, the local Linux system. And so I'm going to install Pan Python just by issuing this uh, setup.py uh, space install, right? And then this just puts the directories in place and makes it so that you can actually interact with it. So then you call this PanX API. Python script, and you can see I got the version, so that's a good way to know that it's actually running. Then you can do a quick connect to your firewall, um, and the dash T is for the host name of the firewall. If you don't know it or if it's just complicated, just do uh, single quote, single quote, and then it uh, will just go from there. So then you can see this is the human aspect. I, I fat fingered uh, tilde slash dot pan RC, but what this did, I'm going to pause this really quick so I want to explain what just happened. So when you issue this command, right, so panxapi.py-t uh, and then the dash host for the firewalls management interface, dash L, so that's the login, so that's my username I supplied, and then the dash K, I forget the dash K, I think that's uh, going to create my API key, yes, that's what it is, and then it's going to redirect the output to a file that now my user has access to, and I'm going to kind of tighten up that file a little bit so that other users can not use it, but that's where my API key will be stored. And the nice thing about that is Pan Python can now rely upon that API key being locally stored so that I can use it in other commands without having to specify it. So here you can see just a quick test you can do is uh, PanX API, and then uh, you know, you're, you're specifying you want to supply some CLI command. And then in single quotes, I said, show me the clock from my firewall, which you can see came back as uh, yesterday at, at 549. Um, so then we keep going, and now what I want to do, now that I've got the communication to the firewall set up, I want to create a file. And this is going to be a username to IP address mapping file. And you can see I just pasted one from earlier. I'm getting rid of the extra line breaks. Uh, but you can see here that I, oops, let me just go back for just two seconds. There. So what I've got, these are systems that don't have users usually logged into them. So you can see this first one is a firewall interface. Then my chalet, that's this Linux system. It could be a server, it could be a printer. So I was uh, working with a, a, a company and they had all their secret information showing up on WikiLeaks and they couldn't figure out why. So they did like this interrogation with all the employees, they all passed. They, they re-imaged all the laptops, no problems. Uh, and the, the, sorry, the problem kept happening, and they, they did everything they could think of to figure out why this data kept showing up on WikiLeaks. Turns out they had a printer that they'd sent for RMA that came back after repair with wonderful malware installed in the little controller card. Now, who's logged into a printer at any given time? Usually not many people, unless you're like us where you have to badge into the printer in order to print anything, but that's just a user for a short period of time why should a printer have internet access? Or do you have printers generating network traffic that you're not aware of? The great thing about this approach is I can now have uh, every IP address for every single printer mapped back to a username of printer. Yeah. The great thing about that is now I can run reports that say, show me all the network traffic of all my printers. Or I can create policy rules that say, do not allow printer access to the internet, but do allow printer access to the print server or the patching server, whatever. So you can have a lot of fun with this. Um, and the great thing about the API is it's the only way to create a mapping that never expires, okay? So here you can see I'm gonna call that user ID register XML command, or that file, 
All right, it says it succeeded. So now let's go check it. So we'll just issue show user IP mapping all. Um, and all my mappings came back. So let's do that really quickly. What I've got here is uh, firewall A, right? And firewall A, uh, I'm going to go ahead to my Linux system here. All right, and let me make this a little bigger so you guys can see it. So this is that same Linux system I was on two seconds ago. And what I've got is I'm going to issue my panxapi.py command, and I'm going to just pass, so see it came back as success. So on firewall A, let's just see my mappings. Awesome. And you can see that they're, they're counting down. There's a little bit of word wrap going on. But so there's my mappings, right? So that's all. And that was so easy. And I can recall that script as often as I want. I can write new mappings into that file however I want. But what we want to do next is talk about how to do redistribution. So as soon as I find my mouse cursor, there we go. Let me just show you guys this one thing. All right. So... In the scenario, we've got two firewalls and panorama at the top. Now, what we're going to talk about is how to turn on a listener on each of the firewalls and panorama so that a user ID agent can reach out to that listener and ask, basically, what are your mappings, or that the firewall can forward mappings as they happen or redistribute them up through panorama. So in order for panorama... Uh, a firewall to send mappings to Panorama, you got to turn this listener on on an interface. And I'm going to use the management interface today. And then you go configure uh, a user ID agent on the firewall to send these mappings up to, sorry, you configure redistribution to send these uh, mappings up. But then you add the firewall as a user ID agent to Panorama. So then I would do this for my two firewalls such that both firewalls are feeding their mappings up. And that's great. But what firewall A, the guy on the left, sends up to panorama, firewall B on the right would not know about unless I do the opposite as well. We so go. what I'm going to do is conf configure listeners on both firewalls, configure agents in panorama to forward what the panorama has learned about down to the respective firewall. So let's look at that really quick. So first thing I'm going to do on firewall A, that's this guy here, I'm going to go to interfaces management. All right, and all I have to do is check this box to enable user ID, and this is just a listener component. Then I'm going to come down here to user identification, and I'm going to open up this user ID agent settings just by hitting the gear, go to redistribution, and this is where I define uh, a collector name, like a username and a password that then Panorama will use to talk to this firewall. And to keep things simple, I'm just going to use a very, very strong username and password, as you just saw me do there. Next, I'm going to come over to user ID agents, and I'm going to add Panorama as an agent so that the firewall can grab mappings from Panorama. If you look in Panorama, I've already done that for both firewall A and B. Cool. And on firewall B, I've done everything I'm showing you on firewall A. Sound good so far? This is great. Awesome. Okay, so let's add this one last agent for Panorama. Now, the great thing, if your firewall is added to Panorama, you don't have to specify a host name and port or any of this other business. You can just choose Panorama from the drop down. So, so real quick, what, what end yeah. of the conversation are you configuring right here? Are you configuring the guy with the box or the door? Great question. Uh, so what I did up on the setup, so device setup interfaces management, I configured the door. That's the listener component. Okay. Uh, let me just recap that. So I, I did that part, the door on the firewall. Uh, next, when I configure the guy, right, to talk to Panorama, this is the second part. This is what I'm doing right now. Got it. Uh, so I'm just saying, hey, Panorama is a user ID agent that can forward mappings back down to the firewall. So I'll just click OK and commit. Once this commit's done, we'll see our light go green. And then... While that's going, let me go show you. Let's look at Panorama. See what mappings Panorama has. Oh, I lost my connection. Dang it. Commit's probably going to finish too soon. Right, take a drink. Come on. I know. Yep, yeah, there we go. Oh, that's one thing we didn't do is we didn't. Uh... What am I doing? Where is my. Can't yeah, already ch chatted that in. Yeah. Let me just. There we go. So we'll just do show user. IP dash user mapping. Oh, got to do all. And you got to have space. There we go. All right, so no mappings, right? And if we go look at firewall A, we have no mappings because the ones I sent in earlier had timed out. And let's just confirm this with firewall B. 
All right, so while he logs in, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go back to my Linux script and I'm gonna feed those mappings back to firewall A, right? So that's done, let's confirm. Firewall A has mappings, Panorama has mappings, and let's see firewall B. Awesome, firewall B has mappings. One interesting thing you'll notice that the timeouts for firewall A and firewall B are very, very close, but Panorama gives really, really long timeouts. Um, and also you can see that the, the source, user ID agent, that's what the UIA is, versus on the firewall, the source was the XML API. And then firewall B also shows user ID agent. So you can see I fed the mapping into firewall A, that's where the source was XML API, then it was mapped to Panorama, that's where the source was user ID agent, and then it was mapped from Panorama down to firewall B, and the source again was user ID agent. So that's it, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, and let's see, I don't have any questions in the chat, but you know what, if you guys have questions, let's see, maybe there was one, uh, no. Uh, feel free to ask them in the chat, uh, otherwise we can have a little Q&A kind of after the session ends. Yeah, so this is also BYOQ, bring your own question. So by all means, uh, we're going to have a, a, an opportunity for folks, and we'll look at the chat again. I, do, I did notice we do have a question earlier on. Uh, Mark, I do see your question, so we'll come back to that. Oh, I missed it. In just okay, sorry about that. So let me share my screen here once again. Oh, Mark, to your question, I was using Nano to create the, um, the user ID agent or user ID register uh, file, but you can use any editor you want. All right, so for those of you who want to learn a little bit more about this and the invitation that uh, Mitch sent out, I uh, sent out a little video. Here's a couple of other resources that you could use. There are some resources online in the live community. Module 11 is where we spend some time looking at how to configure the basics of user ID. Mitch, of course, uh, took us to the next level with that uh, great script example and focusing on uh, redistribution. And, and then we also have some additional videos on Palo Network's YouTube channel. So you can find these uh, pretty easily. Here's an example, user ID resource list. Lots of information here, how to set up the agent, how to install the agent. Um, uh, if you haven't taken the 210 course, right, I encourage you guys to look at that. Uh, because we go through all of the features of the firewall, user ID being just one part of it. And then we have some additional videos here, right here, user ID redistribution, uh, which walks through the very things that Mitch was just uh, talking to us about. All right, now we wanna move on to our next section. We've got a special guest here for us. Uh, this person is um, famous, at least around here with us. Uh, he's famous. <laughs> yeah, so this is this is Bob Williamson. You can see him here on the right with a, another famous actor as well. Uh, Bob Williamson, he's, he spent three years at Palo Alto Networks. Before that, he was a network administrator at a K-12 through boarding school. Before that, he worked as a VMware and Palo Alto Networks consultant at many companies within the, the Northwest. Uh, he's deployed Palo Alto Networks at a boarding school with a heavy user ID adoption. So with that, we'd like to introduce to you Bob Williamson. Let me just turn his camera on here. How's that? Ah, awesome. Hey, thanks for joining us, Bob. Well, thanks for having me. Can I call you Jason? Jason? Uh, you can call me Jason. So what, what, can I, uh, what kind of information can I give you? So, so I have a question for you. What was it like when you deployed user ID at this, this boarding school? Just tell us a little bit about the scenario and, and, and what it was like. Well, that, that's what makes this scenario so interesting, right? Because we've got K through 12, and as part of the dorm students, because they're only 16 to 18 years old, we had to have dorm parents live there as well. So we had adults living in this place. We had 9th through 12th graders living there, staying all night. And then the day school was the younger kids, right? So as part What's of making them... Different use age groups and, and some of their wants, needs, I guess I know education usually is pretty lax with certain firewall security policies. So uh, what was that like? Yeah, well, see, that's where it gets tricky because the students ninth and grade and above actually own their own computers. So it was like a bring your own computer thing. Uh, yeah. Along with that, they brought their phones from wherever they lived in the world and expected those to be on. They wanted their PS4 on, they wanted their PC on. And then we had the adults who wanted 24 hour access, of course. And then, of course, we had the uh, people who worked there, a lot of Windows computers. So we're talking Windows, Mac, uh, iPad, 
kiosk machines for, for uh, students to do certain things to check in and out of the dorms. And so how, and then of course they always wanted reports on what these kids are doing. Ah, so that's kind of so, how so it all where, got started. Where did user ID play in the whole, the, the whole scenario? Well, initially it was, they wanted to be able to see who was doing what on what computer, because there's also a lot of shared computers, uh, yeah. along with their other devices. But um, as it progressed, this is a, uh, it's a, it's a school where they have special testing, international testing and whatnot. So it got to the point where dad asked me to block a group of users from accessing Google for one hour on next Thursday because they had an exam, they had to use their computer online, really? but they didn't <laughs> want them using Google. That's genius. Right? For example, right? So to set up one rule that would expire within one hour and then they'd be off and running. Uh, nice. And then along with that, they, you know, I had to go through and search for logs for users that did do things that they weren't supposed to at a particular time. So uh, that's awesome. So, it's, you know, if you throw all the different pieces in it, so we're looking at probably 1,200 devices total. And different kinds of users, right, too. Right. Yeah, man. The, you know, the K1 and 2, uh, those young kids couldn't even type. They had iPads. Right, right. So we had to bypass user ID for those particular devices. Uh, and then, so of was, course, yeah, real quick, the one thing yeah. that, that uh, people don't recognize, there's a couple things about user ID people don't recognize, but you can run it on multiple subnets. Uh, oh, okay. Right? Uh, multiple um, zones, and they all match into that same database. So these students could be working on their school computer, but also have their phone on an SSID that's on a different VLAN, right? So you spin up an SSID for private devices, it goes into a sub interface on the firewall, it parses it out and does a user ID as well. And that way you could, by referencing a single rule, multiple zones, you could ha have it affect that student's filtering for all the devices they potentially use. Nice. So you used it for both enforcement as well as reporting and logging. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that, nice. that's, I think people forget about the, they always go, oh, user ID. Cool, man. I can get a report on what this kid's been doing. Yeah, but there's a heck of a lot more, man. You know, you can right. actually reference it in QoS. Do you think about that? So yeah. So, so what was the user experience like when you implemented all of that? Did, they, did the students even know? Well, that, that, that is, yeah. let, let me go back. So, so yeah, so they knew because with their private devices or other non AD devices, they would have to use captive portal. Uh, okay. So they have periodically got that kind of hotel page where they had to sign in and tell, tell you yeah. who they were basically. Now we hooked the captive portal, or I hooked the captive portal in Kerberos, and it would immediately authenticate against AD. So that would add to the, I, the IP user mapping. Sorry, I have to take a sip of this beer. This, this, uh, absolutely <laughs> it's not your thing, huh? <laughs> You're it's just showing off for us. I, okay. Oh, yeah, look at that. Uh, but, uh, uh, what did that does that check as well? No, it's, it's out of Georgetown. Oh, it's Seattle. Right. It's Bud Zimtha. Bad is Ziva, yeah. Bad is a... Bad is a... But anyway, where, where were we at? So, uh... <laughs> so, so I got another one. So um, what did the, the school admins like about having, I mean, not just the ability to, to run reports, but uh, like what was their experience like administering user ID once you handed this off to the, the networking team? No, it was me. I was the networking team. Oh, you were the, you were it. Okay, good. Yeah, it. me and another guy. But the the... To step back even further, so, so the dorm parents who live there 24 hours a day wanted access all 24 hours, whereas the older students, unless they were seniors, were certain they had to be cut off at midnight. So the enforcement piece was really huge, and actually it became primary. Secondary was reporting. You know, once in a while, I have to search through some logs. So how to implement this in the easiest fashion at the time, because this was version 4 or 5 of oh, wow. Palo Alto Never Skier, uh, we used AD because as we all know, right? People log on their computer, hits a domain controller, leaves a Kerberos authentication uh, event, sucks those out immediately and changes the user ID. It's perfect, right? Yeah. Uh, as long as the OS X units, the Mac, the Apple boxes are AD bound. So as part of getting them on our, on our school network, we had to AD bind their computers. Now, you don't have to do that today, though, right? With, with all the different uh, mapping resolution methods, you could, you could use, uh, obviously, Captive Portal, Global Protect, maybe that would be easier. Or... Yeah, except these are private devices, right? It's kind of this gray area. 
Yeah. I mean, getting a private device to join the school's domain, I bet that was a bit of an uphill battle as well. It was just a requirement, it? you know, at the beginning wow. of the year, we would, we would attach all of them, uh, all of the hundred students, we'd go through one day and just bind them all. And, was, and then when they leave after four years, we'd unbind them and hand it to them. Interesting. But, uh, and they didn't like, there was always that concern if, if, you know, we put something like GP on whether or not we could, you know, watch Spy them on and stuff and yeah, you know, when they're off site, yep. there, there is a certain amount and you could do GP in a non, in a non tunnel mode, but that's yeah. Right. In, in well, our I mean, situation, the, that was best. The API approach that we just looked at could, could also work pretty well, right? If you tied that into like a, a record keeping system that the school already uses such that oh, once yeah. a student, stu leaves maybe that mapping goes away tied in with dhcp or ipam or something like that yeah i mean there's th certainly other ways you could could have been done at the time this was their best option sure. uh, it gave us the captive portal gave us an option to uh, allow students to have friends come to, the, to their home because it was their home nice. uh, and then they would just hand them the, the password to the ssid and then allow them to log on as themselves right so that would be one way of them cheating is letting their friends get on but then we could always reference who logged on anyway because they'd have to give them their password if that makes sense well that works great because a, a single username can have multiple ip addresses associated with it so i imagine that worked out pretty well yeah yeah it worked out really well now, so, now uh, but we had a question come into the chat sorry jason do you want to go no, no, no. Uh, go ahead. Take the take the question and uh... yeah. So, so there was a question that came in from one of the students on the session today. She asked, uh, "Did you use the golden triangle to bind the Mac stuff to Active Directory?" <laughs> or was it <laughs> oh, that should be you renamed to the. I got another word I would use instead of golden triangle, but uh, I won't use it online. Uh, no, we, we got away from that fairly quickly, uh, and it's super easy to bind Macs to to DCs. There is there are a couple tricks though, you know how end users don't shut down their computers, right? Yeah, and no asleep. matter what you tell them, they just close their lid. It's primarily Mac users. Let's be honest, right? You know. <laughs> so as as Mitch mentioned earlier, there's a timeout value, right. right? So what happens if somebody oh shuts their lid, goes to Christmas break, unknown user. Right, unknown user. And if you've got all your rules set up correctly, that unknown user is going to get a, at the very least, hopefully they'll get a captive portal. But, you know, uh, if you have that set up. Uh, yeah. So then you think, well, okay, we also have Exchange Server. Everybody's run, we're running Exchange Server, running Outlook, right? You could monitor Exchange. Yeah. Well, yeah. here's a hot tip for you Exchange on OS X, as well as Mac Mail and these other options, use what's called EWS, Exchange Web Services. Yeah. So you don't authenticate. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, I was going to say, so you don't authenticate to the server itself. It's through some kind of web call or whatever. Yeah, you authenticate through IIS. Mm. So I battled that hard trying to figure out how to parse out out of IIS. So, so you know, you mentioned it's more solid from the left to the right on that one once. Uh, and that's rainbow of slide. resolution. Yeah. 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 And, and that, actually, I would suggest that you're, that's almost certainly true. But... I think you have to take into account the different situations that, that you have to deal with in the real world, right? Everybody says install GP. That's easy through group policy, but not if you got 80% max. Right. So, yeah. You know, so yeah, it's a good, good thing to go by, but you also real world. So, so, so I got a question for you about, this will be our, our last one, just in the interest of time. Um, it, as, as a parting thing, what would you suggest to uh, a customer or, or a, an implementer who's a little bit trepidatious about deploying user ID, maybe either they think it's too difficult or, or they're afraid of the amount of information that, that could potentially come back on individuals. What would your advice be to someone in, in that kind of scenario where they're, they're right on the edge, but not sure if they want to take the leap? Well, as far as the implementation, you don't have to have user IDs in your rules. So, I mean, you could just implement it, run it through, and then you can start seeing it's gonna, the resolution and the logs that you'll start seeing users just won't just don't choose to block them so you can do it fairly easily right so you can uh, phase without, it in kind of thing. yeah yeah and then and slowly build your rules above your existing rule set uh number one number two i think it's huge i think it's one of the most important things out there honestly and i think it's underutilized uh people like i say people think of it mentally as some way to get a history of somebody but actually it's a true enforcement piece you know, a kiosk that's out there, somebody logs on, and unless you've got user ID, you have no idea who logged on to it, and all of a sudden they're yeah. browsing the internet. 
That, that's huge. A lot of times uh, we look at user ID from the standpoint of knowing what people are doing, but when you think of it as standpoint of from a security you know, uh, perspective, and then you start thinking about, okay, what about user activity towards the center of your network and in the data center and monitoring unauthorized users, right? So you see Joe's traffic going between, you know, uh, two tiers of an application that normally that traffic, you, know, you shouldn't see Joe's traffic there, right? That should only be sanctioned service accounts or something. There's a lot of security application to user ID. Um, yeah, it's a very significant technology. Oh, it's huge. And I, I, and you tie, the, other, the only other thing I'd mentioned uh, would be tying it to QoS, I think is, is a tremendous value as well. And I know people argue the QoS is not that important, but if, if somebody, if, if for example, you have a user who has to have the best YouTube resolution because they're showing it on a big screen, you know, add that to a QoS rule, give them the best point. possible resolution for that user or for that group. Uh, yeah, that's great. I've had excellent, excellent results with that. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Bob, we have something we want to do, and want to know if you'd stick around for this. We have this little segment we like to do right before we leave the day in the life of a trainer. And you're a trainer, and yeah, trainer, I'm a trainer. So, what we're going to do is in the next 60 seconds, talk a little bit about uh, just a tip, some sort of travel tip, something you've learned recently. Uh, something along those lines here. So I'll put our timer on right here. So wait, so I'm answering these? No, it's all of us. So so I got oh. one. Uh, air, so on an airplane, if you're TSA pre-check, just a tip, the liquor bottles, the little minis, they go through TSA just fine. <laughs> so tip. Yeah, I learned that from you. That's a good one. Uh, <laughs> track your points. Track your points. I just took my family Violent. to San Diego for free for a three-day visit to the zoo. Free hotel, free flights. Oh, you just went to the zoo. Yeah, I mean, it's not that far, right? Get, I'm I'm used to flying, so you know. Google Maps. I like Google Maps for reviews of places to eat, especially. It's one. That's tip. I think one of the coolest tips that Mitch you shared uh, was how to hack the thermostat in a hotel room. Oh, yes. So if you're like me and you like a cold night's sleep, uh, Google how to turn the thermostat lower than the the limit that they they give you by default. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I'd, I'd suggest keeping keeping in touch with the people you've taught. I've got some incredible friends over throughout the world now. So, perfect. All Thank right. you, Bob.